have the good intentions. So we are in the lucid word, going over the obligatory knowledge, basically not in detail. Yani going over it basically not in detail. And we reached the section on dealings. And now we're going to read what the author has for us that's called useful information. And so the author, may Allah have mercy upon him, then mention some additional useful information about expenses deducted from the inheritance before it is divided amongst the inheritors. Uh, so without me looking into dictionaries, maybe this word inheritance here should be estate estate expenses deducted from the estate that's what the dead person leaves behind so i'm going to go ahead and look in the dictionary the estate is the interest or quantity of interest a man has in lands tenements and other effects fortune possessions property in general the general business or interest of government not that long so the dead person's estate uh because why i'm saying that because what's here says his inheritance it says here some useful information about expenses deducted from the inheritance before it is divided amongst the inheritors but the money left over by the dead person is broader than inheritance the tariqa is what's in the arabic uh, the tariqa is what the dead left behind. Uh, but that's broader than the inheritance because this money that the dead left behind, some of it's going to go to his debts, some of it's going to go to his will, and some of it's going to go to, it, to the inheritance. So I'm going to use it this way here. So inheritance is tighter, is more specific than all the money that the dead person left. Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So here the Sheikh has some useful information about expenses deducted from the estate of the deceased before it is divided amongst the inheritors, or you could say the heirs. Then it's going to be a silent H. Sounds like heir or a homophone, a, a homophone or a homophone. Two words that sound the same but spelled differently. Heir, silent H. The inheritors. So he, may Allah grant him mercy and forgiveness, said, It is invalid to distribute a deceased person's inheritance, yani, a deceased person's estate, among the inheritors, yes, or to sell any of it until, it says here, their debts are cleared, should say his. This word, their supposed to go back to the deceased person here but looks like yani some might someone might get confused because it looks like it could go back to this word here inheritors it is invalid to distribute it says a deceased person's inheritance among the inheritors or to sell any of it until their debts are cleared so it should say his it is invalid to distribute a deceased person's inheritance amongst the inheritors or to sell any of it until his debts are cleared. Now here his means his or hers. Provided they had debts, Yanni, if, if this one, Yanni, provided he had debts, if this one had any debts, then before the heirs get any money from the estate, then the debts need to be paid. Including any due zakah. He neglected to pay before his death. That means including the debts to God. There are debts to the people and debts to God. Like a zakat that a person neglected to pay, the word neglect there is important. So to establish that it was obligatory on him. This word neglect means it was obligatory on him. Or else he wouldn't have been negligent. Including any due zakat he neglected to pay before his death. Yani, and any other debts to the people. And until the will he instructed to implement after his death is executed. 
So the will is a gift after death to other than an heir. A gift after death to other than an heir. So the heir should not get any... Uh, one should not leave a will for an heir. That's what came in a hadith. If the deceased person were required to perform hajj and umrah, according to the Shafi'i school, Yani and Umrah, that's according to the Shafi'i school, being required required to perform Umrah, that's Shafi'i school. Some schools said only Hajj is a requirement, Umrah is Sunnah. If the deceased person were required to perform Hajj and Umrah, i.e. he was liable to perform them, but neglected to do so, until he died, then the expense of performing them is deducted from the estate before distributing it. Now, maybe these words work, inheritance. Maybe it works the way it's written here, but I'm just, without being more sure, I'm avoiding it. Then the expense of performing them is deducted from the estate before distributing it as well and is given to an individual who will do Hajj and Umrah on his behalf. That's clear. Someone's going to perform the Hajj or Umrah on behalf of the dead person with the dead person's money. However, selling the deceased's assets to pay for these things is permissible. And you might have to liquidate some of the deceased person's property to turn it into cash flow to pay for things that need to be paid. That's permissible. The inheritance is like an item pledged as collateral. Yani put up for collateral, collateral rather. The, the, uh, let me see the Arabic text here. So here's the Arabic text. I'll just translate directly. I'll start from the top of the paragraph. Then the author, may Allah have mercy on him, mentioned a benefit in clarifying what is done with the tariqa, which I'm translating as a state, before distribution. And so he said, may Allah have mercy upon him and forgive him. It is not valid to distribute the estate of someone dead to distribute it to the heirs. It is not valid to distribute it to the heirs. To distribute the tariqa to the wadi theme, the estate to the heirs, nor to sell any of it, as long as his debts are not fulfilled. If he had debts, and that includes as a cat that was obligatory on him that he didn't perform. And as long as his will, his bequeath, has not been fulfilled, that's his gift after death to someone. That which he uh, bequeathed to be spent after his death. And as long as the price of a hajj and an umrah have not been Deducted, and as long as the price for a Hajj and an, and, and an Umrah have not been deducted, if they were both obligatory on him, that would be by them staying on his account. It means he got the money, became obligated to perform Hajj and Umrah. He didn't do it, so it's there on his account. And then he died. And he didn't fulfill it until he died. So this deducted money will be given to someone who will make Hajj and Umrah on behalf of the dead person. So all of that is not permissible unless what's being done is selling something of the estate to fulfill any of this. Then it will be permissible. Yani, this will be permissible activity with the estate of the dead person before the distribution. And so the estate, this is what I was looking for, 
It's making sure it wasn't another word. The estate is like a collateral for this. Money put up for collateral. Once you put money up for collateral, what do you do that for? You put it up for collateral against the debt. You owe someone. There has to be a confirmed debt. And then you say, okay, I'll pay your debt. I'll put this up for collateral. If I don't pay your debt, we'll sell this and you'll get your money that way. So collateral is a legal insurance, a religiously legal insurance, because it's an object. Uh, so the estate of the dead person will be like a collateral for this reason. So just like it's not permissible to spend what has been put up for collateral before fulfilling the debt to which the collateral is linked, uh, unless you sold it, so to pay this debt. So likewise, that's how the estate is. All right, so that's what it says in Arabic there. Let me go back to the English. So it says here, however, selling the deceased assets, yes, that's right here, assets. So here, then the expense of performing them is deducted from the estate before distributing it as well. However, selling the deceased's assets or estate, so you can say asset if you want, to pay for these things is permissible. The estate is like an item pledged as collateral. So I think it's important difference here. With regards to ensuring that the above mentioned matters are fulfilled before giving given the right of disposal. So now continuing here in translation. It says here, in order to make it easier to understand, the author may Allah have mercy upon him, then gave another example of sales that are not valid until the rights associated with them are paid. He said that in the same respect, the he said, like a slave that transgressed. فَأَتْلَفَ مَالَ شَخْصٍ وَلَوْ كَانَتْ جِنَايَتُهُ بِأَخْذِ دَانَةٍ So here, this word inheritance now has been inserted. It's not really in the Arabic. Not even estate is there. So what the Arabic is saying is, he said, in the same respect is a slave. In the same respect is a slave who commits a certain offense and thus destroys the property of another person. So it says here, the inheritance is similar to the case. So the translators put this here for probably for clarity. But if I just translate what's there, uh, he said that in the same respect is a slave who commits a certain offense. A slave that uh, transgressed. And thus he destroys the property of another person. And this slave destroys someone else's property. Even if it were even if even if it were taking a danuk, says here, a danuk is one sixth of a dirham. The slave is is encumbered with the said debt, therefore rendering his sale invalid until the debt is repaid by the owner or the creditor permits his sale. The creditor is the person whose property was destroyed by the slave. Okay, so what all this means simply is, if you had a slave and then your slave damaged someone else's property, that person can't come to you and say, I demand of you to repair this property because that's your slave. All that's going to happen here is that the owner of the slave, his, his slave is going to become a type of frozen asset for him. He can't just sell the slave only. No. He could pay the fine, yani you know, pay whatever is due because of what the slave did. And then he could sell the slave. Or he could free the slave so that the person could go after this ex-slave. Yani you know, sue this ex-slave. Can't sue the slave. 
So the master, he could free this slave, then he'll be an ex-slave, and then the other person could sue the ex-slave, that means take him to the Muslim judge. Or he could pay the slaves, yani he could pay the fine, what I'm calling a fine here, and then that slave's not going to be a frozen asset for him anymore, and then he could sell him. So that's the meaning of what's stated here. And from here, we can attach two cases, two important cases. What if your child damages someone's property? Who has to pay for that? The child has to pay for that. If the child has money, you can take it out of the child's money to pay for it. If not, then this person has to wait until the child reaches puberty, and then he could sue this pubescent person. Sue here means take him to the Muslim judge, for example. So that's one case. And another case, subhanAllah, what is obligatory on you if you damage someone's property? What's the rule? The rule is that you have to pay for the depreciation. The rule is not that you have to Repair the thing that you damaged. So that's one of those cases, like I was telling you probably in the last lesson. Sometimes the lines between what's customary amongst the people and the religious rules get blurred for some people. So if it's common that, like the way they do insurance, for example, if, this, if someone damages your thing, that he's going to get it actually fixed back the way it was before it was damaged, that's what's common amongst the people, then someone might think that that's the religious rule and the religious obligation. And he would think this is his right. And it wouldn't be his right. So that's why it's important always to think about these different cases. What is the religious rule? Don't settle with what's normal amongst the people. Don't assume that what is normal amongst the people is the religious rule. So could the parent pay on behalf of the child? Let me ask, inshallah. If you don't think twice about things that are just done normally in the society, then you'd think sometimes, you might assume or you might slip and think that this is a religious, that this is religiously valid. Take copyright, for instance. Most of them might think the copyright is fine. In fact, Rarely do I see a book published by a Muslim that doesn't have a copyright uh, printed on it, that doesn't have copyright printed on it, rarely. Even the Wahhabis, maybe others too, they copyright the Mus'haf. They copyright the Book of God. How's that? People sell things that are not sellable. Like, for example, maybe someone dabbles with making beats like basically music but let's say it's not haram so what he might do he might they say sell a beat to someone you can't sell a beat to somebody that means you can't sell the sounds to somebody what you could do though is sell a flash disk to somebody what if somebody made a beat with his beat machine. He wants to sell it to somebody. Yani, not he wants to sell it to somebody. Somebody wants to buy it from him. They say, you're a great producer. I want to buy this beat. I think Jay-Z will like it, for example. So what, does, what should he do then? He could say, all right, I got all the files on this flash disk here. I'll sell you this flash disk with all the files on it, and you do whatever you want to do with those files. This is a valid sale. So they'll say, I'll sell you this flash disk for $1,500 with all the information on it. You said, do you have another example of what people would do if they do damage or someone to someone or something? So, for example, someone scratches your car or dents it. Or something else of yours that has value. 
So let's say he damages your car. So what's he obligated to do? He's obligated to pay for the depreciation, not to get it repaired. So what does that mean? It means that means if he could have sold his car for ten thousand dollars, but now that it's been damaged, he can only sell it for nine thousand with the existence of this damage here. Then the one who damaged it has to pay him a thousand dollars. He's not obligated to get it repaired though. As for doing damage to someone that has his own details, what if you knocked out someone's tooth? What if you caved in his skull? What if you gave him a gash with a machete, for example? What if you hit him and made him lose some of his mind? He became dumber or slower, Yanni. Or you hit him, now he speaks with a slur. He can't speak clearly anymore. So that has its own details. Or what if you clipped off his eyelid? Or you clipped off his buttocks cheek? Or something else? Or you knocked out his tooth? That all has its own rules. It's clear for you? Then the Sheikh went on, still talking about deals. He said, it is prohibited... It is prohibited to weaken the desire of the buyer or the seller, which is done by a third person. For this third person, Yanni, there's a buyer and a seller, or rather, there's two people who want to do a deal. And then there's a third person who is not originally part of this deal. So what he basically does is uh, he undercuts someone. That's the meaning of weaken the desire. He says to the, to the original buyer, and what's meant by buyer here though, that he didn't buy it yet. Let me see what the Sheikh said in Arabic. Al-ba'ir wal mushtari, yes. The Sheikh did say the buyer and seller. But we're saying here, they didn't. he didn't buy it yet. So he's not a real buyer, this means what we're saying here is they're negotiating. They're still in negotiation stage. So they finally came to a price. Says to, to he says to him, sell it to me uh, for five hundred. Says ah uh, nah eight hundred. Uh, seven hundred. Seven fifty. Okay, seven fifty. Okay. So they didn't do the contract yet. They just negotiated the price. Now this third person steps in to undercut someone, whichever side he wants, whether he is the one who wants to buy it or he's the one who wants to sell it. So he wants to buy it enough to buy it for more than what the original buyer, prospective buyer would have bought it for that he just negotiated. So this third person tells the original buyer, I will sell you a better item for the same price, or I will sell you a similar item for a lower price. We're telling the original seller, do not sell to that person. I will buy from you for a higher price. Sheikh says, this is unlawful after the price has been agreed upon. So right here, that statement means they didn't actually do the deal yet. They're just negotiating. I.e. each of the buyer, yani both the buyer and the seller here, instead of each of, say both. I.e. both the buyer and the seller declared their acceptance of that price. Otherwise, it is not sinful. That's also something you might fall into if you don't watch it. I actually saw it happen with some brothers. One brother was selling a bike, uh, a mountain bike. So he was going to sell it to someone, I don't know, for what, like $50. The other one accepted. So there was a brother right there. Right after he said, right there, he said, I'll buy it from you for $75. Uh, so because we learned, then, uh, because we, we learned, we were able to interject there and to yeah, I mean, clarify that this is not permissible. See what will happen if you don't learn? You might fall into a sin without realizing. Knowing that you can fall into a sin without realizing is great knowledge. Because if you're being oblivious to that, 
If you are oblivious to that, then you're just going to sin. Because <laughs> your ignorance is not going to make you not sinful. And you should know that all the sins that are mentioned in the book of obligatory knowledge, those are not all the sins. There's still more sins, even if you learn the book of obligatory knowledge, there's still sins that are not mentioned in there. At least if you learned, you can start to get a feel for something and then at least avoid say, I don't know, this one smells funny because you learn. I'm afraid there's a sin there and then you'll stay away. There's even, subhanAllah, there's sin of the nose. Did you ever hear of sin of the nose? It's not in the book of obligatory knowledge. There's not a section in there about sin of the nose. What's the sin of the nose? To smell the uh, marriageable woman with desire. To smell the marriageable woman with desire is a sin of the nose. So it says here, for example, if the seller were auctioning the item that he owns to see who would pay more for it, then this is not unlawful. That's permissible. Auctioning is permissible. Who will buy it for this much? Someone say, I'll buy it for that much. And then he might say, anyone will buy it for more? I'll buy it for that much, more, going higher and higher. That's permissible. Also, it is not unlawful to weaken the desire of the buyer or the seller for other than the purpose of buying from the seller or selling to the buyer. Like, you're a third person, it's not your deal. You're there with your friend. You say, no, don't get that. That's bad quality. I can take you where you can get something better. So that's not the same thing. It's not haram. For this reason, the author said, with the intention to sell to the buyer or buy from the seller, with that intention, this undercutting with this intention, that's haram. Furthermore, this prohibition is more severe if it is done during, it says, the cooling off period. That's interesting. Yani, during the warranty, during the warranty, if it is done during the time of warranty, i.e. after the contract has been conducted, but before it is binding, warranty goes up to three days according to Ash-Shafi'i and requires a statement. So someone sells something to you, you can say, uh, I'll buy it from you under the condition of being able to breach the sale for up to three days. So he says, I accept. Then that's valid. Then you have it. You're going to use it. If three days pass and you don't breach the sale, then it's binding. And within those three days, if you take it back, you can give it back and then take your money back. So the Sheikh is saying, if you undercut after the sale, during the time of the warranty, it's a bigger sin. This is the case whether the option to cancel the sale is restricted to the sale session or extends beyond that. Yani, so they're exp explaining here. More than what I said. I said the warranty time that goes up to three dates. Yeah, that's true. Even yani, the original warranty time, which is as long as you're still in the same session, before you separate from the person. You did the sale with the person and you're still in session with the person. As long as you're still in the session with the person, then you can breach the sale. So inside of this time, after the sale, inside this warranty time, it's a bigger sin to undercut the buyer or the seller. Or even if that warranty depends on finding the commodity defective. Yani, if you have a defective item, you purchase a defective item, once you discover the defect, you can cancel the sale if you do that immediately. I talked about that before. I think it's going to come back. Also, it is forbidden to buy essential foods such as bread, dates, and similar staple foods. At a time of high prices, 
يعني during a time of uh, I don't know if inflation is the best word maybe something more than inflation not just inflation the prices go up like maybe a lot of people in the world are experiencing now but like crisis time for example very hard situation at a time of high prices and necessity that's the meaning of a time of high prices and necessity so it's not merely inf uh, inflation uh rationing due to shortage i'm not sure if that works basically there's a commodity but now it's hard to come by or it's so expensive because of problems like war or famine or something like that to, to buy essential foods such as bread dates and similar staple foods at a time of high prices and necessity in order to hoard it and sell it later at a higher price that's haram not invalid though yani means person wants to monopolize here corner the market in this uh, precious commodity not just precious but uh, essential commodity and it's forbidden to offer a higher price for an article that is more than its value without the intent to buy it but rather to deceive a third party to fool them into thinking that this article has a high value and thus deceiving them into buying it this basically means it's haram to be in cahoots with an auctioneer just being in the audience making offers so that others will bid higher making bids so that others will bid higher that's haram it would apparently be considered sinful if they write a will and choose to leave their inheritance to some of their children but not the others we have no say about who gets the inherit what inheritance who gets inheritance and what they get we have no say about it we only have a say about the will that's a gift after death and the will should not exceed one third of one's assets if the will exceeds a third of the assets then the heirs can block whatever is more than a third the heirs are mentioned in the quran surat al-nisa who inherits and what percentage they inherit it is not left up to us allah tells us in the quran that the humans do not have the knowledge to know how to distribute that the best way so it was taken out of their discretion altogether so your question is would a parent be considered sinful if he wrote a will and chose to leave the inheritance to some of the children but not the others so maybe your question means whatever he wrote in his will is the inheritance that's what i think your question means and so yeah so he left some to some of his children and not others but the religious rule is the will is other than the inheritance the will is a gift after death that should not exceed more than a third of the dead's assets and the inheritance uh is going to be distributed to the heirs after the debts are paid and after the will is uh executed whatever's left goes to the heirs is that clear so if he did write something to try to write some of his children out of getting some of his assets in a way that interferes with the portioning that's revealed in the Quran then whatever he wrote is disregarded altogether I mean what you have to let's stop here I think we'll have one more session before we finish this segment of the book Do you have any question I can answer for you I mean, Wafiq, Sayyidi. Is it safe to say, give it to them before death instead of the will? There won't be a will, though. So the will is, by definition, a gift after death. So if you want to give somebody something before you die, then you can give it to them. 
as long as you're not dangerously ill. Dangerously ill. If you are dangerously ill, like you're so sick and you think you're going to die, you just become restricted in more than a third of your money anyway. You won't be able to spend more than a third of your money. You will automatically become restricted from more than a third of your money until you're cured. You can follow up with that if you want to. Amin Wafiq, Barakallahu Fikum. That includes if you're going to get executed. If you're going to get executed, then you become restricted in more than a third of your money. I mean, unless you get exonerated, for example, then the restriction will be lifted. Or he means you're not going to get executed anymore. That's what I meant by it. Yes. Go ahead. So what about the will regarding the max, which is the third? Does that include the heirs? Should not include the heirs. You should not make a will for an heir. He already has share. Yeah, he already has a share as an heir. So you don't make a will for an heir. If you made a will for an heir, the other heirs can block that. So if you make a will for more than a third, or, yeah, for, if you make a will for more than a third, then the heirs can block whatever is more than a third. And if you make a will for an heir, the other heirs can block that heir from getting any of the will. I mean, and you too. So does that count if you're the beneficiary? You mean the executor is the beneficiary? Does that count if they're your beneficiary? I don't know what that means. I thought beneficiary is someone who gets money from someone. Or is a deserving recipient. The question is not clear for me, though. If you want to restate it, feel free. Or if you want to take the mic. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. So I was just trying to be clear of the hair. If the hair is the beneficiary, do is that considered a third or is that just something different? Uh so uh so so a beneficiary is someone who deserves to get Yani to receive some payment. So there are people who I would say they are beneficiaries. That means they are heirs. The heir is a beneficiary automatically. Like the children, they always inherit from the parent. The children always inherit. The parents always inherit. The spouses always inherit. And the brothers and sisters, they inherit. As sometimes some people, they would inherit had it not been for someone else. Like if, it, if you're, if your mother w weren't still alive, your grandmother would inherit. But because your mother didn't pass away, your grandmother doesn't inherit. So then she wouldn't be a beneficiary of that grandmother with the existence of the mother. So everyone who's supposed to inherit something, who they are and their uh, percentages are by revelation, except for some cases that are by Ijtihad. But the base of this is by revelation. The revelation gave us a clockwork so that we could, Yanni, it's basically the revelation gave us a calculator. You just have to learn the chapter of inheritance. And then when you learn the, the chapter of inheritance and you have all the rules in place properly, then you just put the formula into the calculator. If someone passes away, you look at his statistics and put it into the calculator. The statistics means you say, okay, passed away. Who did he leave behind? He has an uncle, for example, say uh, his, his, his uncle from his mother, his uncle from his father. He has a son and he has a grandson, for example. A grandson from his daughter, for example. So then if you have the knowledge and you say, okay, so when I put that into the calculator, it means this one gets this much, this one gets this much, this one gets this much, like that. And this one doesn't get anything because of such and such. So, I mean, barakallahu fikum, you too. Any last question? 
سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك